There we go. Um, we will circulate a copy of the recording and the slides by email um, as soon as we can. And uh, Miriam's also added a copy of the slides in the chat just now. I'm not expecting any fire alarms where I am, but do keep an ear out for this where you are. Um, this is a safe place. Please do respect one another and our panellists um, when you're asking questions and adding comments in the chat. And there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. And we will strongly encourage you to use the Q&A function, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. Next slide, please. So this is the agenda we're looking at today. So I'm gonna do a quick introduction. Um, Rob's gonna kick us off with how to get started with your fundraising strategy before handing over to Vicky, my colleague at NCVO, who's gonna talk through some practical steps to maximize your fundraising potential before we move on to our excellent small charity case studies from Lucy and Tanya. Then we've got a bit of time for questions before uh, a bit of signposting and we close the session hopefully at 12 p.m. Next slide. So just for those who are unfamiliar with, with us. Um, we are NCVO, that's the National Council for Voluntary Organizations. It's the largest network for charities and volunteering. And we're proud to represent and support over 17,000 members, uh, that's voluntary organizations of all sizes. Um, but the majority of our members are very small, um, like I'm sure a lot of you on the call. But at their heart, all of our members have the aim of making the world around them a better place. Next slide, please. And we'd love you to join us. Um, by becoming a member, you can save time and money and um, get access to information guidance, tools and templates, research, training and more. Um, and if you're a small charity with an income under £30,000, membership is free. Next slide. So the reason for us all being here, um, it's Small Charity Week 2023. Um, a very happy Small Charity Week to you all. This week exists to celebrate and raise the profile of the small charity sector. And I hope you've been able to get involved in lots of the events um, and things going on already. There's so much going on this week. It's really great to see. This year, it's brought to you by NCVO and uh, funded by Lloyds Bank Foundation. And you can head to the website uh, to find out more about upcoming events and how to get involved. So a little bit from me to uh, set the scene about why we are here today. So one of my roles at NCVO as part of the practical support team is on our help desk. So that's answering calls and emails from small organizations um, about anything to do with the setup and running of um, their charity or not-for-profit organization. And as I'm sure this comes to no surprise to any of you, but fundraising is a hot topic on our small charity help desk. The COVID-19 pandemic changed the nature of fundraising for, for small organizations. And many small charities found themselves quickly pivoting to digital methods, trying things out that they'd never done before. But the last year or so has seen a return to in-person fundraising. However, against the backdrop of the cost of living crisis that we find ourselves in, uh, the war in Ukraine, amongst other things, charities must now find new solutions to meet these new challenges. The pressures of cost of living layered on top of the challenges of the pandemic, followed by 10 years of austerity means inequalities in communities are widening and there is increased demand on small charity services. In parallel, the cost of delivering your services is going up and we're seeing that raising income is more challenging with increased competition for funding, and um, inflation eroding value of income. We know that small charities need unrestricted income. And what we're going to explore today in this webinar is a number of ways to raise this. 
So just before we uh, kick things off with Rob, I'm just going to launch uh, a quick poll to find out um, what method of fundraising, aside from trusts and foundations, that you're interested in implementing in your organization. There's a couple of options there on your screen. I'll let Miriam close the poll when it looks like everybody's had a chance to answer that. I imagine it was difficult to pick just one. Yeah, the one you're most interested in. So I I can see the results here and I can see that 49% of people have chosen corporate fundraising um, as something they are most interested in implementing in their organization. That's not a surprise to me, actually, as we do get an increasing number of queries about that on the help desk as well, followed by community and event fundraising. And then a number of people have also picked individual giving and legacy giving. Excellent. Great to have that information before we get started. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Rob, from uh, the Chartered Institute of Fundraising. Over to you, Rob. Thanks, Amy. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. A very warm welcome. As someone said on the chat, uh, welcome on the longest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. Really nice to see everyone and, and really nice to see such a mix of charities from so many different parts of the country. Um, so I'm Rob. I'm, I, I lead on all the, the, the membership and charity giving at the Chartered Institute of Fundraising. And our job basically is to encourage charities, to help charities, to bring more money in, to do the amazing work that you do. So if we go um, on to the next slide, I'm gonna talk a little bit today about how we can start getting off on the right foot and really give you, hopefully, take away some tips, ideas, some thoughts, challenge perhaps some of your, your thinking um, to really accelerate your fundraising. Um, and, and, you know, First of all, I just want to say that that, you know, for, for, that, that what we do as, as charities, the sector only exists because of fundraising and fundraisers. Really, essentially, that's the cornerstone of all our work, because without that, we can't do all that amazing work. And so often, I think that we hear that, you know, you know does fundraising work and how can we uh, encourage people to give? There's no doubt about it that the statistics are very clear that people give because when they're asked. And so that my, my first message to every single person on this webinar today is take that message back because if you don't ask, you don't get. And um, fundraising is absolutely critical, whether you're a huge charity or in our cases here, lots of small charities. Um, it's obviously, it's, and it's a social good. I think fundraising is often uh, quite in line in terms of um, the way it's perceived often by colleagues because you think all oh, fundraising well I feel a bit uncomfortable about that but ultimately my message back uh, again is unless you're saying you want to stop work stop your great work tomorrow we need to fundraise everyone needs to play their part and everyone within your organization can help to do that fundraising because it's all within your interest um, and, you know, 63% of people that donate go on to take positive action as well. So it has, a, has a, a, an important uh, knock-on effect in terms of volunteering, campaigning. And, you know, we do all have that, that shared vision and, and, and your supporters will have that shared vision, no matter how small the organisation, about changing the world for a better place. Um, and... You know, fundraisers can be paid employees, but I know for many charities, particularly on this webinar today, um, you know, you will be, um, you know, it could be volunteers, it could be, and I've, in the last week I've spoken to two trustee boards who were very much, you know, getting involved, supporting and thinking about fundraising and how they can create a culture of fundraising. So you don't need big budgets, definitely not, to be able to do fundraising. 
If we move to the next slide, what is fundraising? You know, you can raise for a whole range of things. And, and Amy's poll earlier just showed that. I mean, you can you can fundraise for cash gifts, for legacies. Interesting, only 5% of you said you needed more information on legacies. Uh, we'll come on to that later. Either it's because you all know loads about legacies or that perhaps you think the legacies aren't for you. Let's see. Um, you know, and that might pay for lots of things. It might pay for your direct costs, for your salaries, and, and, and a donation could be given in two key things. Uh, like for example, a restricted gift, so that has to be ring fenced in a particular way, or the best ones of all, non-restricted, and you can use it for it in any way you want to. And of course, we all know that, that a lot of the costs that we have to do as a, as a charity are things like, you know, might be the cost for, for, for salaries, for setting up the office or whatever it is. So it's a range of things that fundraising can be uh, and, and, and the donation can, can be transformative in many different ways. So if we go on to the, the next slide there, um, I, I think that, you know, hold this thought for a minute, that, that so often when we ask, why are we fundraising? So we need to get more money in. And of course that's true. But if you don't have a plan like anything in life, if you don't know where you're going, very hard to actually have something that's coherent and meaningful as a strategy. So my first, uh, you know, kind of uh, key point here is you need to think about where you want to go as an organisation. And that's really important because that tells you the scale of the need, the scale of what you're trying to fundraise for and gives you that clarity of purpose about where you all need to head as an organization. Many of you, you'll be doing part fundraising, as I suspect, as part of your role. You can't do fundraising on your own. You should not do fundraising on your own. You need to think about how you can transform the organization to be a fundraising organization in whatever way that means to you. And as part of that, you need to have a clear strategy of where you are going. So if we go on to the next bit, so you always need to start with your needs and your priorities. What do we need the money for? You need to adopt a needs led approach and you need to think about you should only be working with funders if they're aligned to your strategic aims. I, were, I When I was um, in a previous charity, we always had a, a phrase which is don't chase the money. And, and what we meant by that was don't go for money that is outside of, for projects that are outside of your core focus, because ultimately you'll end up doing a lot of work. The money will come in, the money will go out again, but you haven't transformed as an organization in what, what you want to do. And so be really clear about where you want to go and how fundraising is going to enable you to get on that journey. Um, so these, again, they're, they're really simple things that you can do as a small charity. Outline your fundraising case in simple terms, and you'll get the slides afterwards. But yeah, think about what's the problem, what, what are you trying to solve, and why you are the best organisation to provide that solution. And as small charities, hold on to that third point, because as small charities, you will have found a, a, a particular issue, a very local, probably small area of, of, of need um, where you are the best organisation to provide that solution. And you should think about what will be the successful outcome of this. Sounds simple, but you'll be amazed how many charities I speak to don't do this. And so often it, 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 it requires a united view and think about what will be the impact of those outcomes. So plan it like a roadmap from A to B to C to D. It doesn't cost money, it just can't, it requires a little bit of time as a team, no matter how small that team is, bring your, bring your board together as well and think about where you want to get to. Um, now, um, Amy's poll, you know, it was really interesting. You know, many of you wanted to know about corporate fundraising. Um, which is great. Um, half of you said that, but look out top right there, legacies. Um, that's a very high ROI. And one other thing I'll say is that um, many small charities are really benefiting from legacies now. And some of those gifts can absolutely transform an organization, um, really transform an organization. And 
um, you know, that's huge potential. Some of them take longer, you know, to bring in that money, so some of them are, are quicker, but that gives you a sense of the opportunity. So you can see here in just a bit more detail, the, the income per pound invested um, outside of statutory grants, legacies are the, are the highest area, but we can see some really successful areas. Things, for example, such as corporate giving, you know, it's fantastic, but can also be very, very challenging because there's a huge amount of competition. We've certainly seen that come through in the last uh, few years that, that corporate giving has been really challenging because of the, the high levels of competition. And also because corporates like everyone else have been squeezed and their profits have been um, significantly reduced compared with um, a few years ago. So one of the key things in terms of a takeaway, um, sorry, you ask about return on investment, Abby, that's ROI is return on investment. So if you put a pound in, how much are you gonna get back from that pound? If that answers your question. Um, think about for you, a case for support. Um, it's a central idea and it can be adapted for different campaigns and it should be, really should be a motive. So in other words, it pulls at the heartstrings and, and that really is the core thing that makes you the organization that you are. Why should people give to you? What is that case for support? I'm gonna give you an example in a bit. So here's one of my favorites. Here's a great case for support. Um, the the RNLI. Now you might say, okay, that, that's a massive organization. I could never compete with it, the RNLI. The great thing is you don't need to because the great fundraising principles that charities like RNLI do are exactly what you can take into your charity and say, these are exactly the same principles. We'll just take a minute to just to look through this. So RNLI, their, their current fundraising director has raised over a billion pounds for, for charity. She's an incredibly inspiring uh, fundraiser. Um, and at the heart of this, is creating something that's very clear. Number one, more people than ever need our help. What's the need? When you're, as your charity, think about what would you put there on the back of your envelope? What is it that is, that is the core need for your charity? And what is the problem that you're trying to solve? So in this case, too many people are still dry, are dying, you know, because of the, uh, uh, and drownings continuing. And so there is a need there for that case for support. So you can think about that in your own charity. And also then it's a financial ask there and we don't have enough money to rescue them all. Their, their core proposition, and they really struggle with this, you know, even as a big charity, they, they realize that they struggle to explain all the different areas of work. And I see this all the time with many small charities. What they came to was a single idea was to save everyone. And that the heart of that is that's what RNLI now communicates. We have something and it's all anchored in that, that case of support. So have a think about what that might be for your charity. Here's a story, I love this story. Do take time to think about that. Stories are emotive, they change people's uh, thinking, they engage people. Try this type of exercise in your own organization, think about the stories that you could tell. Here's one of John, he wanted to save 36 people. He only sold, save 35 that day. You know, he still thinks about that 36th person and that's what we need to do. We need to save everyone. Think about that from your own charity's point of view. It's powerful and it runs through all their communications. So a, a, a building block for a case of support, it will have a need, it will have a solution and an urgency of now. Why do people need to give to you now? How are you gonna solve that problem? And remember that, that, that your donors aren't giving to you, they're giving to, the, to, to solve the problem. And you need to think about that. You're facilitating to help solve the problem. And the ideally, it should be unique. And one thing I, I, you know, I love about small charities, why we've got so many small charities is because there are, you've all looked at and identified a, a, a specific need, no matter how small, and you are best placed to serve that need. And the urgency then is thinking about how can I get people to solve that problem now? 
And whether you want to look at corporates, whether you want to look at community, they're all that they, they runs right across. So thanks. Uh, for, so here's an example of, for action for blind people. I'd really suggest you try this yourself. Think about what your vision is. So put this block, go, but go back after today's webinar and, and try this out yourself. What's your vision? What's the thing that's getting in the way of solving the problem? And what's the hero? What's the thing that, that can really solve that problem? And who's going to benefit? So vision, enemy, hero, recipient. Try it yourself. Try it with your team. Ask your board to try it. What you come together is a case for support that's so powerful that you end up with a story like r and lies where you can tell that story about we need to save everyone. We need to then tell that story about people like John. It's so powerful and every charity can do it. And you'll be amazed what a difference that makes. So the heart of this is you're unique and all the, the, the charities who, who, who are celebrating and part of your charity week, you're, you're all, you've all got the opportunity to tell your story of how you're going to solve a problem, why it's important that people give to you now and, what, and how the world is going to be a better place. It's an amazing opportunity, and I would just encourage you, you know, over these, when you listen to the other case studies, to also think about how they've created that case for support and try that case out for yourself. You are unique. Best of luck, and thank you. And now I'm going to hand over to Vicky. Sorry, I lost my mouse there for a second. Didn't know what happened. Um, <laughs> so hi, um, thank you so much for that, Rob. That was really great. And you're getting lots of rounds of applause, which I can see there, which is wonderful. Um, my name is Vicky, and I am the Partnerships and Fundraising Manager at NCBO. Um, I've worked in fundraising for coming up to 15 years now. Um, and I'm hoping to share with you today some information around uh, how to treat your donors, so individual giving, and then also um, to talk very quickly about um, corporate fundraising for non-corporate fundraisers. Um, so I've got 15 minutes and I'm hoping we're going to get through. So next slide, please. Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you is, are individuals the key to future proofing your charity? And I believe that the answer to that is yes. Um, the 2022 NCBO Civil Society Almanac reported that the public continued to make the largest um, uh, amount of donations to the charity sector, total number of amount of income to the sector. 51% comes from individuals, so we should all be spending time in that place, um, accessing individuals. But the question you might have is, who are those donors? Um, so can I have the next slide, please? So I don't know about you, but I often hear fundraisers telling me, my charity is really difficult to fundraise for because we don't save lives. And I don't know if any of you feel like that here um, today, but it is something that often comes up. And my advice there is to not try to make your everyone care about your organization. Care really well for those that already do. So where might your donors be? Uh, so the answer to that is they could be trustees or former trustee. Oh, sorry, we're not quite at that slide yet. Sorry, thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, so they could be trustees or former trustees. That could be volunteers for your cause. Um, it could be previous lapsed donors, people who have given previously but haven't given for a long time. Um, it could be former staff. It could be beneficiaries or former beneficiaries or people related to your beneficiaries. Um, essentially, it could be anyone who has had any contact with your organisation, people who already know what you do, already care. They are the ones um, that we would be looking at as your, as your initial starting point. Uh, next slide, please. So once you've got your donors, um, it's all about donor love. Uh, so I want you to be thinking about these people as people that you care about so much. And my first, first sort of statement is, 
if your significant other were to buy you a really wonderful and thoughtful birthday present and you didn't say thank you, are they going to be okay with that? Are they going to be all right with the fact that you didn't even say thank you? Um, so I think it's something to think about when you're thinking about your individual donors. You ask and they give a really wonderful gift and then you thank them. They know their gift is appreciated. The next crucial step is to report back, to show them how that money was spent, to show them the difference it makes in their organization. Uh, you want to do it in this cycle. So ask, thank, report, and then you can ask again, repeat. Um, and if you follow this cycle, people will continue to trust your organization. People will know that their, their money is being spent well, and they will feel great about giving. Um, so please continue to follow this cycle. I will give a disclaimer. I did not create this slide. Um, this is by a man called Stephen Screen, who um, is a fundraiser based in America. And he, I would thoroughly recommend going and researching him after this, um, this session, because he does incredible podcasts. Um, so can I have the next slide, please? So the next thing to think about when you're doing, doing donor love is surprising and delighting your donors with small gestures that make them happy. And yes, this is a quote by myself. I apologize, but I still stand by it. I think it's a really strong quote. Um, and so I'm going to talk quickly about um, positive memory triggers, also known as delighters. Um, yes, I've just seen the question. Stephen screen, same as your computer screen. Um, so uh, positive memory triggers, also known as delighters. So these are things that are sort of out of the ordinary happy moments that make donors feel wonderful about giving to your organization. So this can be anything from handwritten thank you letters, thank you phone calls, updates from beneficiaries. Um, it could be uh, thank you events, so events that are not around fundraising, but hosting an event for all the people that have given to your, your organization or to your cause. Um, during lockdown, I actually sent voice notes to donors um, to tell them how wonderful it was they were continuing to give support us through, um, through the pandemic, and they were really well received. So small gestures that make them happy. They don't have to be expensive. They don't, you don't have to spend, have big budgets to make your donors feel wonderful. Lots of these things can be free. Thank you. So that was my very quick um, amount of information on uh, treating your individual donors really well. Um, and now we're gonna talk about corporate fundraising for the non-corporate fundraiser. Um, so just as a disclaimer, most of this information, so I do work in partnerships at NCVO, but most of this information is um, essentially looking at when I worked at a small charity, a less than a million a year turnover charity, and um, getting a household name partner. So the first thing I want to talk about is that I did not have any corporate fundraising experience when I first started. Um, and so I want to talk about starting corporate fundraising and how you manage people's expectations. We're going to talk about a specific case study, like I say, about getting a household name um, and some key actions for you to try. Uh, so next slide, please. Firstly, unfortunately, I do not have a magic wand. And as much as I would love to wave a wand and give all of you wonderful partners, I cannot do that. However, what I do have is experience and lessons learned, which, which I'm happy to be sharing today. you're starting a corporate fundraising and you need to manage some expectations the first thing the first lesson is um, around the length of time it can get to a corporate to have a corporate partner it can take between typically between 12 and 18 months from the start of your journey to actually securing a partner uh, and that is an average and so I just want to be really clear that you need to know that in terms of planning and thinking ahead it is like usually the next financial year is when that partnership is going to make a difference um, you need to be thinking about what a partnership will look like for your charity are you the type of charity that's going to get charity of the year partners if not that's OK, but you need to think about what kind of partnerships your charity can offer that no others can. Um, the next thing, I need to be defining what success looks like. And success needs to be clearly defined to understand expectations, but also demonstrate the journey that you're on. Um, so are you looking for one partner of a particular size? Are you looking for four partners or 10 partners? 
Are you looking for a, a significant amount of prospect partners, no finalized partnership? What is What are some defining moments of success for your organization? If you're just starting out in corporate fundraising, understanding this early on will really help you to be successful as you go. Um, because as I say, it can take a really long time to get um, a corporate partner. Um, I would also map out some success moments through your journey. So you've just had a really great meeting or you've put a presentation in front of them or you've seen them face to face and they come to see your work. Things like that will help you to feel the success moments on the journey to securing a partner. Um, I'm going to give you a quick key lesson for something not to do. Um, so I do not want you to let other people tell you what corporate fundraising should be for your organisation especially if their opinion is not based on any knowledge. Um, so I have a quick story. I worked at an organization. They did host a lot of events and everybody in the organization kept telling me, stands at events are a real money spinner. We're gonna make loads of money. It's a huge opportunity. Loads of companies would love to pay thousands of pounds to come to our events, uh, except nobody had any contacts. Nobody had done it before. Nobody had... Uh, even worked out what the offer would be and some of the events did not even have a space to have stands um, and I spent an exceptional amount of time trying to achieve this because I felt this pressure from other people telling me that this is what I should spend my time doing um, and I just wish that I had known and trusted my gut and said actually I don't think this is going to be the right thing because there is no sort of preemptive work done it's quite a lot of work and actually, I'm going to spend my time on other things that will give a better return on investment. I wish I had done that. Please try and try and remember that and be confident in, in not in, in saying no, in, in not going along with everything just because everybody says you should do it. Um, my next slide, please. I feel like I'm really whizzing through because I'm very aware that I've only got a few minutes. Okay, so this is a case study of how I got a household name partner. I'm gonna make a bet that all 282 people in this call have heard of this partner. And this is their logo. And I want to see in the chat if anyone actually knows who this is before I reveal. So just a quick moment to see in the chat. Anyone got any, any clues? Oh, we've had a couple. Okay, we've had a couple of right ones. So drum roll, please. Next slide. It is the Bank of England. Uh, so I worked with the Bank of England at my last organization and it was a less than a million a year charity. Um, so I'm gonna run you through how this happened. So um, just a bit of quick background. The last charity I worked for was the British Youth Council. Oh, sorry, can we go back to the other slide? Thank you. Um, so just a quick bit of information. Um, my last charity I worked for was the British Youth Council. Now, they are not a traditional board. They are a youth-led charity, which means that all of their board are under 25. Um, so we had, and they had no fundraising going on at the charity before I arrived. Um, so they had, they were surviving on like two grants from the government. Um, so with no traditional board and no traditional examples of how to get a partner, I was tasked with finding a corporate partner. Um, and I went to lots of training about corporate fundraising, which I'm assuming is why lots of you are here today, is to learn more about fundraising and, and perhaps corporate fundraising. Um, and lots of the training would tell me to look at my network, but not a single member of our board had a network. Uh, and we weren't in touch with like previous donors or, or anybody that had been involved with the organization before. So there was no network. Um, so the first stage of getting the, uh, the Bank of England as a partner um, was to try and contact people. Uh, and I was scrolling through LinkedIn and um, I had to look for, out for things that were related to young people because that was the organization I was working for. So I had that search on young people, youth, et cetera. Um, and I saw this post from Bank of England that had like two likes, but like no interest at all about resources that they had created to engage with young people with economics. And I thought there's something there because there's obviously no engagement with this. And I had a look at the resources and it just didn't look like it was very good. 
Um, so I thought, okay, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to find who I think is the person that was probably in charge of this at the Bank of England on LinkedIn. So I found their head of marketing and I found their head of outreach. And I did that cold approach on LinkedIn where I said, hi, I've seen your post about your resources for young people. I work at the British Youth Council and I think that we can help you. Uh, and that email, uh, that uh, LinkedIn message turned into an email chain where I was just explaining a bit more about um, our work, which turned into a phone call with the head of marketing and their head of outreach, which then turned into a meeting. And I would say here, it was very important that I was talking to the right people. Um, sorry. So when I was having these conversations, I remember men mentioning to my CEO, I'm speaking to the Bank of England, and I think there's an opportunity. And you could just see the money symbols in the eyes because the Bank of England, they print the money. So they must have loads. <laughs> and actually, um, they are an organization like any other. They have got budgets, they have got um, they have got sort of restricted workloads, they have restricted staff, they, they have to achieve certain targets, they have to achieve certain outcomes. They are like any other organization. And so I couldn't just go in and go, you should give us a million pounds because we're good. That was not realistic. And I had to speak to them like I would a person and understand what they might be looking for. What are they trying to achieve? And in those conversations, I found out that surprisingly, no young people were engaging with their, with their resources. And I was like, Did, were any young people involved in creating your resources? And then it became a, actually, no, young people should be involved. We can help you with that. Um, so it was understanding their needs and their goals and really treating them like people. So I invited them to see our work in action probably about eight times. They came to see young people doing things and engaging with things so they could really see the value of the work we were doing. Uh, and I was treating them like individual donors. I was calling them up after they'd been in. I'd sent them thank you letters for, for engaging. And they had not given us a penny at this point, but I, I knew there was an opportunity there. I will also give you the advice that you will have to attend a lot of meetings, especially if you're working with a company like Bank of England. You attend, I think I attended one a month the entire time I was trying to cultivate them. Um, and I really understood their expectations. I made sure I understood how much budget they had available, how much work they were willing to put into this type of initiative. Um, like what their expectations of us were. Were they speaking to any other organizations that do similar things? I made sure I was having these really rich and valuable conversations. Um, and then I had to have patience. This, this partnership took 19 months from that first contact on LinkedIn to actually having a signed agreement. I am really pleased to say that that agreement still exists. They have been going for longer than five years um, with, um, in partnership. And it is an over six figure salary, uh, six figure partnership now that does contribute core costs to the charity I worked for previously. And that is a full cost recovery plus partnership, um, which means that not only do they pay for all the work that they want to happen, they make a contribution to the charity as well. And I think that there's a really important lesson in showing a corporate your value. Um, so next slide, please. We're just going to cover the, the key points of that. So be led by your work. What can you offer? What do you do really well that nobody else does? Consider who the right person to talk to is. Are you even speaking to the right person? Be open and flexible to their needs. Make sure you understand what they might be trying to achieve. Just because the Bank of England prints the money does not mean they have unlimited funds. And I had to know that going into these conversations. Treat them like people. They might be the head of some fancy in a really big name company, but they're still a person. They still want to feel valuable. They still want to be asked how they are before you ask them for money. Um, invite them to see your work in action. It's, it's, it, it's so compelling in, in a way that other things can't be. Um, and be prepared to attend a lot of meetings and be okay with that. And then know your value to them. Know that you are helping them solve a problem that they might be facing and ask for full cost recovery plus a contribution to your work. So next slide, please. I've got some things for you to try, hopefully today or tomorrow. So I want you to think about your list of ideal partners. So throughout my career, 
I have been asked so many times, why don't we just ask for money from Apple or Google or Nike? They've got loads of money. And it's my answer is always, unless you know someone there, unless you've got a contact or we have a way in, let's just throw that list of people in the bin. And let's think about what an ideal partner for our char charity looks like. So is it, is it a drinks company that would work really well for us? Like if you work for a food bank and you get a, a, a supermarket to contribute every month, is it, is it, I don't know, if you work, if you're, if you're aiming for a dentist, are they going to support your local fate? Like just think about what a partnership for your charity looks like. I want you to understand your value. So do you have an audience that a company might want to reach? Do you have a product that your company might want to use? Do you have expertise? So at NCVO, we have really strong expertise around what charities need and want, and the companies like to engage with that. Um, I would say get on LinkedIn. Once you've worked out who, you, who the companies you want to engage with are, get on LinkedIn and make sure you're speaking to the right person. I would also say to pick up the phone. It's, it's old fashioned, but it is still the most effective way to make sure you're speaking to the right person and have a conversation. It's, it's easy to ignore an email. It's easy to ignore LinkedIn, um, but it's harder to hang up on somebody. Um, and then treat them like people. As I say, like you could be talking to the CEO of somewhere really fancy, but they're still a person and they want to feel really valuable. So that is the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take questions. I'm going to look in the chat and I'll also be around at the end of this session. So thank you so much. And I'm on to Lucy. Hello. Thanks, Vicky. I hope everyone can hear me all okay. That was really interesting, both um, Vicky's and, and Rob's perspectives. I'm making some notes myself. Um, so uh, as mentioned, um, I'm Lucy. I'm the Income Manager at Child.org and I'm going to be talking today a little bit maybe controversially as we've had some slides on ROI etc about events fundraising um, and I really want to showcase the role that events fundraising can play for small charities in helping grow income, steward supporters and grow your reach. So if we can have the first slide please, that'd be brilliant. So um, I'm Lucy, as mentioned, I'm the income manager at child.org and I look after our communications, fundraising and trading income. Who are we? So I'm representing child.org. We are a charity championing community-based healthcare to make pregnancies and births safe for mums and their babies in Kenya, where sadly one in 32 babies don't make their first birthday. We believe no mother or her baby should die from preventable causes and we work with pregnant women, communities and government to change this. We work with mums like Mercy, who joined our team mum antenatal groups and learned practical, life-saving advice so that when she started bleeding postpartum, Mercy knew to get to hospital as soon as she could. She had the money saved and a vehicle ready to take her, and she received a life-saving transfusion at hospital. Now, Mercy is just one of the mums um, that we work with, but her story encapsulates what we do and why it's important. And she is got the cutest baby ever. So love sharing her story. Um, so that's who, what we do, but who are we? And I think this is really important as a case study to kind of showcase and, and sort of leverage us and see sort of where, where we fit. Um, and you can kind of um, look at us versus yourself and your own organizations. So at child.org, we're a team of nine. We are actually going recruiting another staff member as we speak. Um, five of the team are based in Kenya, including our CEO, Marty. And then there are four of us in the UK and we have three working in fundraising. So I know that will be a little bit bigger than some of the organizations um, that have joined us today, but I thought let's be transparent and share it all. Um, and you can see kind of how we use our team in fundraising. So our turnover sits between 300 and 500,000 per year. We really want to be um, reaching, uh, we're raising over a million in the next two to three years. And we have built what we think are very in data informed and strategic fundraising plans to get there. Unlike talent, lots of small charities, um, we have a different challenge in that most of our income is unrestricted. And I admit we are very fortunate there. So. Conversely, we are working to build resilience and, and build our restricted funds in trust and foundations and corporate partnerships. We, like many small charities, want to build resilience in our fundraising strategy um, and get that you know, those big uh, those big restricted funds to help us really make a step change in the work that we do. And the reason that I wanted to sort of say this early on is to 
caveat and say we're not a pure success story like many small charities even if we are a bit bigger we face many similar challenges of limited resources limited capacity limited technical skills and we're still learning and building but we are really ambitious and we have strategic plans to become the leading perinatal charity working in sub-saharan africa and how we're going to do that is by harnessing and using events fundraising that play a key role in you know what we do they bring in surplus unrestricted funds for us. They help us they help us grow our reserves, cover core costs and invest where needed. Sometimes in things like building a new CRM um, or like starting some new programs and um, piloting, getting in some funds that we can use to create evidence to be able to go and apply for bigger funds. So events fundraising is really critical to where we are now. So next slide. How do we use invest fundraising, events fundraising? What does it look like? Um, I'm going to focus on one example today, which is called Charity Concierge. Um, and I think I'm hoping it'll be a bit relevant and um, exciting to explore. So Charity Concierge is an inter intergenerational festival volunteering program that brings a little bit of luxury to some uh, of the festival goers at the UK's biggest festivals over summer. And there's some key information to bear in mind um, about what makes Charity Concierge successful and to think about how you can kind of use these same principles and harness them um, in your own charities. So number one, Charity Concierge rests on volunteers. They are the star of the show. We have over 200 volunteers that volunteer over 4,800 hours every year, which is incredible. We could not do what we do without them. It was born from a relationship with a major corporate partner, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but kind of highlights some and echoes some of what Vicky's been saying earlier. Thirdly, it piggybacks a pre-existing event. So we're not setting up the event ourselves, it already exists, but we go and we add value there. And like fourth point is that at festivals, volunteers provide a service in return for donations. So we're not simply asking for donations, but we are offering something. So there's an entrepreneurial element. So as I mentioned, Charity Concierge was born in 2015 after discussions with one of our major corporate partners. We wanted to find a better way to support one another. And we could see that as our corporate partner is a festival organiser and there was an opportunity to fundraise at festivals. Charities at festivals is nothing new, but there was an opportunity to do something a little bit different, a bit entrepreneurial. And so we run two services. We trialled a drinks waiting service so if you're sat in a festival field and you don't want to walk and leave your spot to go to the bar, you can flag down a waiter, they'll take your order, um, bring you your drinks uh, in return for a donation. And we also run festival taxis that Shirley, our brilliant volunteer, is, is demonstrating at the front of our um, golf buggy there. And we basically offer lifts around the festivals. We take overloaded festival goers from campsite to car park um, and haul stuff in again in return for donations and this is really lucrative you know one taxi ride we um, charge in inverted commas 35 pounds more or less than our volunteers can can do some deals but if you imagine that we have maybe 15 taxis across the festival working over four days you can see how that starts to add up so we work across four festivals at the moment and we're bringing in around 75,000 in income and over 40,000 in profit, which is incredible. Um, those are kind of the primary benefits for us. We get this unrestricted cash that comes in as a result of it. And I just want to say as well that that profit includes staff time. So we have an events officer that works on um, managing charity concierge and recruiting volunteers and working with the festivals. Um, and uh, their salary is, is kind of takes up part of, of um, the uh, expenditure of charity concierge so just to highlight that if you build these events right you can get some of your your core team funded through them um, second kind of real benefit for us is profile boost so we are like quite a small organization I know we have a, a pretty good turnover for a small organization but our reach is tiny through charity concierge we are able to talk about child.org to over a million people and we've done that through being on the festival websites footfall at festival um at festivals we're um on featured on social media and last year we did two 
local BBC radio interviews. We also are able to cement our partnership with uh, our corporate partner because we are there at festivals, we're engaging with their staff and we make their festivals more luxurious. The festival taxis are so in demand that I think there might be riots at Latitude if we don't bring them in the future. Um, and on top of that, we are then building this really strong volunteer network with a high return rate and lots of secondary engagement. Things like matched hours, you know, some of our volunteers work for banks that will see their time and volunteer time matched through donations. Um, so there are lots of opportunities that we can sort of um, piggyback on as a result of Charity Concierge. So this is really roughly what it is and how we use it to generate income and boost profile. And it works for us. It's not without its challenges. Um, and I know we have time later in the Q&A so I can dig in a little bit deeper on, on some of the points um, or questions that you have about practicalities, et cetera. But what I want to say and like my, my challenge is that I'm acutely aware as small charities, it's really hard to justify um, events fundraising in terms of return on investment or capacity. And it's, it's hard to look at like, you know, it looks great. 40,000 pure profit but obviously there's a lot of time and energy that goes into that and we are are spending about 35,000 to run it it's never going to compete with something like institutional fundraising but for us there are other metrics that are really important for our strategic fundraising goals like building our reputation like our brand reach like engaging with volunteers um, for us, events like Charity Concierge form a clear part of this long-term strategy. It is our best opportunity to get in front of people. Um, it provides opportunities to engage with local media. You know, BBC Radio Suffolk, probably not that interested in maternal and neonatal health in Kenya on its own. But by saying, we've got a massive group of volunteers coming to Latitude Festival, they're doing this really cool thing. And there's the charity element. You know, uh, We managed to secure a really, really great interview with them. So it's kind of thinking a little bit more outside the box. Um, Charity Concierge is never going to be our biggest fundraising activity. And it, it, as I said, can't compete with some of the other strands. But what it does do is ensure that we have dependable, unrestricted income that we can use to pay bills, pay rent, but also invest in things like digital fundraising and looking at direct debit acquisition and thinking, how can we convert people that we've seen at, uh, who have seen us at festivals to come and, and sign up to our newsletter, etc. And it's always going to be one of our flagship events because of that. So that's the question that I want to kind of throw to you as small charities is, you know, we know that you need to raise money but apart from just the pure cash in the bank, what other steps do you need to take and what metrics do you want to focus on or share that are important for your strategic fundraising goals? For us, reach is so important. We want to have people know who we are and we have this brilliant opportunity. So Charity Concierge allows us to capitalise on that. And we have plans to sort of convert that over time. Um, it's a brilliant opportunity to harness. And there are so many. You can scale it up, scale it down. And I've seen it in the... Um, uh, in the chats and people talking about tombola etc at a local fate it's the same principle about harnessing and piggybacking existing connections existing events and thinking about how you can present and talk to people about what you do there so that's that's me that's um child.org and charity concierge and yeah please do um pop any questions in the q a afterwards now i'm going to hand over to hania to talk um through another success story Wonderful. Thanks, Lucy. Absolutely loved. I know I can see in the chat that buggy is everyone's top fan. <laughs> yeah, hopefully if you're going to Glastonbury, you raise more of that income. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Hanya Giddens. If we could go to the next slide, please. Um, oh. um, I'm an advisor and a previous trustee of Bees Abroad. I'm also a fundraising consultant where I work with organizations to help build partnerships, fundraising strategies, and maximize their impact. So do connect on LinkedIn if you want to chat after the session. Um, go to the next slide, please. I think that's... So I'm here today to talk about Bees Abroad and how um, at Bees Abroad, we worked with a third party membership platform, Remember Charity, to help diversify income, to bring expertise into our organization and introduce legacy giving. Next slide. 
So I joined Bees Abroad as someone who is fascinated by the role um, that bees and beekeeping play to help our ecosystem, but also the role in job creation to help empower people. There is a lot of potential to grow beekeeping communities in the rural communities and regions we work with in countries across Africa. And this is where Bees Abroad are doing a fantastic job. Go to the next slide. So all Bees Abroad projects are suitable to the local climate they're working in and all projects are led by local beekeepers, meaning the work is truly sustainable and we operate under these three key pillars. Next slide. So another reason I joined as a trustee was the huge opportunity and potential as an organisation. Bees Abroad, when I first joined, was a volunteer-led organisation and the impact they were delivering was so impressive due to the fantastic knowledge and commitment of volunteers and also the trustee board. Next slide. Please. And these are the three opportunities that also really stood out to me before joining Bees Abroad. It was that opportunity to redirect branding, messaging, to help improve reach and brand recognition, but also in helping new supporters to understand what Bees Abroad do. As a side note, all this branding and messaging and the new logo and colours are after a branding project I led on last year. Um, the second area was about the opportunity to incorporate an additional income stream to diversify the income coming in. Majority of the income coming in was purely through grants. And then altogether, there's that opportunity to really increase impact. Bees Abroad are already doing such a great job, so how could this be elevated? And from a trustee perspective, I wanted to see the opportunity for growth, stability, and having a really clear direction. Next slide, please. And there were key challenges at the organization that had to be considered. Um, being volunteer-led, there was a lack of resource meaning there was a reliance on the generosity of time given by volunteers. But this also meant um, there were skill gaps with certain areas and knowledge. So really had to consider which areas of growth and opportunity could be driven. And as with many charities, especially at this stage, it was the start of COVID. Um, income was going down year on year, and there was also a lot of uncertainty. So it was key to ensure that the organization could continue to both sustain and also increase its impact and work. And this can also be really challenging, especially for smaller organizations with introducing completely new ways of working and investing in new opportunities, especially with resources being tighter. And the third area was priorities. And I'm sure every single person on this call experiences this. There's so much to do, so much potential, but only a certain number of hours in the day. So next slide, please. So I had an idea of the key income streams and tools I was wanting to introduce, individual giving, corporate fundraising, online donations, and legacy giving. Next slide, please. And coming from a charity background and you know, really seeing the opportunities around legacy giving, this felt like one of the key priority areas to bring to life. Um, being a small organization, had to really consider what resource we had to drive these new income streams. And when it came to legacy giving, there was a challenge of there was no one to drive this. At the time, I was head of partnerships at the Prince's Trust during the pandemic, so my days are very busy. Um, so this is where I turned to a third party, remember charity, to help deliver and drive this. But I still was there to put forward the case um, for investment added to the organization. Next slide, please. So I mentioned, you know, as a trustee, the opportunity for growth, stability, and a clear direction was really key. And so when considering the Remember Charity membership, there were three key areas I was you know, putting forward for the investment and really having to think about. The first was around ease, so the ease of implementing this, to take up as little resource as possible, but also the ease in maintaining it. As fundraisers, there are endless activities, campaigns and ideas that can grow, but juggling a lot of plates with you know, little to no resource or budget can be really difficult. So as a trustee, it was about understanding, you know, what would it take to introduce this um, new area for the organization that already had a lot going on. The next area was impact. So I wanted to know what the impact was of the membership and of the investment in membership. How would Bees Abroad name be supported as a charity? What exposure opportunities were there? Who did we have access to? Again, linking back to resource whilst also ensuring that we could benefit from this impact of the little resource we had. But what would also be the wider impact? 
not from just a legacy donation point of view, but thinking about the impact to other areas of work. So branding, engagement opportunities, communication. And the third was the fit for Beza Broad. Um, as well as this is a tool to attract new audiences, how would this add value to current warm supporters? How would it improve or elevate what we're doing now? Next slide. So there's a lot to do from creating a clear legacy comms plan to bringing wider volunteers on board, but also understanding how to use the membership. So a lot to do, but no resource. Um, next slide, please. And this is where Remember Charity really played such a key role for us as an organization. Um, I remember my first call with a team, Emma. I was on a lunch break in between my day job and she was fantastic in answering a long list of questions of how Visa Abroad can benefit from membership and the many benefits Remember Charity offer. So suddenly Visa Abroad had access to personalized videos, um, digital media content, ready-made messaging, research on legacies, and also a members area with year round webinars and content to be reading. Next slide, please. So for Bees Abroad, working with a membership body like Remember Charity was such a huge opportunity. You know, after a few months, we managed to run our first campaign. Um, we had, it was the first time Bees Abroad had a real professional look as an organization. We were able to really benefit from the content like using the Wombles in our imagery which was you know, really fun and light and really fun way to talk to our supporters. We also had PR opportunities. So you've got some case studies um, printed in the Scotsman. It really felt like for us, an extension of our organization. So remember charity felt like our extended legacy department. So final slide, please. And so just to end with three key messages around this. Something that can feel quite intimidating to smaller organizations who don't have the resource or budget is that beauty of collaboration and working alongside these industry experts. So seeing these third party memberships as working as an extension of your team and offering resources you wouldn't otherwise have access to. The second is looking beyond the immediate use of a third party platform. So looking beyond the membership, like remember a charity just being legacy giving. So. How can it help create communications during quieter periods of the year? How can it support social teams or finding creative ways to attract new audiences, um, but also bringing in resource or skill sets that you don't always have time for? Um, and the third area is being clear on what your aims are, both in the short term and the long term. So short term budgeting for activity like this can be really challenging with strict back resources and revenue, feeling like you're asking for an investment when you cannot guarantee results. Um, so ensure you truly understand the wider benefits of a membership and how your organization can use it in different formats. There's that short term investment of having access to the content and resources that can lead to that long term investment of having enough of a voice to secure potential gifts from supporters. And that's how Bees Abroad brought legacy giving into our organization. Thank you, and I'll pass over to whoever's next on the schedule for me to pass it over to. That would be me, thank you, Hania. Um, wow, so much information, um, and I can see everybody got such um, a positive response with everyone clapping and sending heart emojis. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you to all of our panellists. Some real uh, food for thought there, I think, for all of the organisations on the call. So we've got a bit of time now for um, Q&A. Um, our panellists have very helpfully been answering uh, some of your questions throughout the session. So if you're not aware, you can see these answers. So if you open the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, um, there are a couple of different tabs and you should be able to see the questions that have been answered. So if there are any that you're interested in, you can see there. And what we will also do is we'll circulate um, a bit of an FAQs um, with these questions and answers, because um, I think that's going to be a really useful resource for everybody on the call. But in the meantime, we've got about 10, 10 15 minutes now um, for any other questions that you might have. So we've got a couple um, still unanswered there. Um, a couple for you, Hania, actually, um, if you're... Ready to answer these? 
Yeah. Um, there's one. That says, one. Oh, yeah. sorry. That's okay. I was going to say, how can I get trustees involved in fundraising? And I think others could probably answer this as well. This has popped up a few times. I'll, I'll say one and I'll pass over to other people. And um, so I'm sure everyone's going to have good input for this one. Um, so a key thing is, I think one thing is, it's always beneficial if across your trustee board, you do have a fundraiser. I think it's really important across the trustee board to have someone who truly understands the opportunities and the wider needs and the, you know, everything that can be done in the world of fundraising. It's really helpful to have someone on your board that has that position. Um, so when I joined, that was the first time Visa Board had had someone with fundraising experience on the board. But if you don't have a fundraiser on your board, attend those meetings, find out when the trustees are holding um, their monthly, quarterly sessions and ask to just bring to life the importance of fundraising and how, what the opportun wider opportunities are to the organisation in, you know, increasing that reach, helping to generate more income, increasing the brand awareness, really bring it to life to them and try and find all those touch points because it's also that education piece of why fundraising is important. So I think there's always that balance of action and what you're working to drive as a charity and you need to balance that with the fundraising as you can only act act on those activities if you've got the income coming in. So I think the education piece is really key. Don't know if anyone else. Yeah, um, uh, thank you. Um, I think, um, yeah, great points. I, I, you know, I, I've increasingly found uh, more and more trustee boards for some small charities uh, are coming to us and, and asking us for help. I think the key thing to say my top tip to anyone who's struggling to engage their trustee board is this is tell them that, that actually charity trustees have overall responsibility and accountability for their charity and this includes fundraising so it's not a question of could they do it could they help with it they must do it as part of the law charity law it's non-negotiable. It doesn't mean to say they get involved in the operational detail. Um, I'll put something in the chat there and I'll send you a link, but, but they absolutely must do. I'll send also a link on the, on the actual full um, charity commission uh, piece on this. But basically it's called the CC20. It's the law around charities that they have to. My advice would be to say two things. Number one, it's the rule of that that they must ha uh, be in, uh, have overall views of the of fundraising, and I'll, I'll try and dig some stuff out before the end of this webinar and share it. The other thing I would say is that that, that my message to the board is always, unless you're saying that you want to, we want to close tomorrow, we that you have to help in creating a positive fundraising culture where everyone is in, involved. So for example, great presentation on legacies there. I like to ask that one of the board is a legacy champion. So, so for, for gifts and wills, why is that important? Even the small charities, you can create a positive culture because it's about giving people the confidence to have the conversation. So that's just consider that as well. Can I just jump in really quickly with something else? Um, so that was really helpful. Thank you, Rob. Um, I was just going to say, so I, as I mentioned earlier, I used to work for a charity that was an entirely youth led board. And so these are young people they don't have as much disposable income. Um, but I would do a myth busting exercise with them at their first board meeting of the year because they would have new trustees joining um, every year because it was a youth board. Um, and in that, I would do a, a sort of what it means to be involved in fundraising. It doesn't have to mean that they are giving, but they need to be involved in some way. So they could be that responsible for thanking donors, or they could be responsible for reviewing the fundraising page on the website. I actually once managed to get one of them to sign up as a regular donor because they were testing the site. And then they just said, oh, I won't undo it. I'll keep it there. Um, so things like that, like really sort of actionable things for your trustees to do. And as Rob says, they are legally responsible for your charity. So they should be kind of leading the way when it comes to fundraising um, and, and showing the value of your organization. Thanks all.
A um, couple of different questions um, coming through. I'm going to pick up on um, a question here. So I don't think we can recommend specific giving sites per se, but do you have any top tips about how to choose which giving site you, you would think suits your organisation? I'll say one thing, but then I'll pass on if anyone's got anything to add. I suppose, I think Lucy touched upon this during her slide deck, but take that, I think when it comes to thinking about these different membership bodies, look at the expertise you currently have within your organization. You know, are you, are you missing areas of skills or knowledge? Do you have really strong gaps um, versus what are the biggest opportunities to introduce new income streams? So if it's corporate fundraising, for example, you've not driven corporate fundraising, but you also don't have the skills and knowledge in that space. Consider using membership bodies for areas like this or third party organisations to support driving this, because you'll find it's probably more cost efficient and effective and more time efficient to bring in someone who can share that expertise of the organization and help to drive it and pick it up. And you can, in the, on the journey of that, you also learn more about it. So you're upskilling your teams. So maybe considering skill gaps, income generation gaps, and balancing those together. I can jump in on, on giving sites. Um, just, I think the core principle, and it's, it's something we've been doing a massive digital overhaul because our website wasn't fit for purpose. A few years ago, we had, we actually decided to set up our own um, giving mechanism so we could take donations ourselves. We don't have the technical capacity to manage that. And fundamentally, you're going to put people off. It needs to be easy for people to donate and give. So I think it's whatever works, to like the easiest and simplest for you. So look at what barriers, is it gonna be difficult? Is it faffy? Is it well known? I know it's sometimes hard to justify like the big wigs and there are lots of small and up and coming um, giving sites that work, but fundamentally the goal is, is there, you know, the, the fewer barriers, the better. So what works the easiest? Because ultimately what you don't wanna do is have someone click to donate and then get so confused by the process that they actually don't continue and, and speaking from someone that that had that issue and had to justify with the board moving towards another kind of more like main brand site because we were having so many issues I think that's the kind of key principle what's the easiest way for people to donate to your cause yeah I, I, Lucy I would absolutely uh, back that up I completely uh, agree with that point I think that you know, it's great that people are asking the questions around admin fees and so on of some of these giving sites. But ultimately, you know, the, these sites need, need those fees to continue. They put a lot of investment into those platforms. Like charities, they're not, they can't do it for free. And, um, you know, you only have to look at the figures. Those, the, 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 the bigger platform raising platform sites you know, by and large, help charities raise more money. And that is your overall objective. Um, and I think I put in the chat as well, you know, many of them do offer uh, the option for the donor to decide whether they're given a, 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 you know, a pay and admin fee. But ultimately, they will help you raise more money. And, and I completely agree, Lucy. Too often, people forget about the customer journey, the donor journey. And um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, the donor journey must be absolutely the heart of your thinking, your thought process, because without that, people are not going to give again. Thanks, all. I'm just trying to pick up on questions in the chat that I, that feel relevant. Um, we've had lots of questions that have already been answered. Maybe one for you, Rob. How important is it to have a theory of change already in place when planning fundraising? Ooh, yeah, good question. I think a lot of, there was certainly a lot of point where a lot of people were getting very, very, um, I want to say almost hung up on on the idea of a theory of change. Ultimately, and, and uh, you know, if people aren't familiar, this this is about how your organisation can create the impact. And and uh, and what that what that looks like in terms of mapping out, 
you know the 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 the, the support in versus the the impact out um i think that i think that sometimes it it can stop hinder charities because they feel it's too daunting too complicated my message to, to most charities would be to keep it simple you know the case for support is is absolutely critical because it, it gives you that clarity of vision of what what you need to raise the money for how much you need to raise what the difference is going to make um and yes of course you need to think about the impact you know so that is part of it you know just think about you know for example in the rnli case that i shared earlier what's that impact you know what does that mean um and i think you know for your own organization you will know that you will know the difference it means so for example um you know the 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 some of the charities it might mean the the intervention means that waiting times are cut you know for people in in greatest need or you're saving x number of people that means that the the state is in government to pay for that that the extra care health care but i think at the heart of it keep it simple because i i see that too often people are hindered by this kind of this thought about i need to create a theory of change i need to create a fundraising strategy and ultimately it can be quite simple in terms of your case for support and then really thinking about what that impact is so if you're writing to a trust and foundation you obviously need to be able to articulate what that impact is but it all starts with that you know that core case for, um, a, a proposition for support Thanks, Rob. Um, I think we probably don't have time for any other questions, but we will make sure that we do get answers to these questions. And I'm going to put together an FAQs doc because um, there's lots of valuable information that's been shared um, both in the Q&A and the chat. Um, and hopefully I can see people have already been sharing that they've already taken some of the suggested actions, which is Brilliant. Um, I can see that this had an impact. We've just got a couple of things before we wrap up. If I could just have the next slide, please. So just before I uh, share a bit of signposting for you um, to some further tools and resources, um, we've just got a snap feedback poll, which we'd be really grateful if you could complete for us. Two quick questions there to get your initial thoughts on how you found today's Small Charity Week webinar. And if you can spare a few minutes after um, the session ends, there will be a short feedback form appearing in your browser when you leave the webinar. We'd love to know what you enjoyed, uh, what you valued, and where we could potentially make any improvements. So I will let my colleague Miriam close this poll um, when the majority of attendees have been able to answer. There have been a couple of questions in the chat just asking whether we're going to share the recording and the slides. So the slides have been sent in advance of the, the webinar today, but we will be circulating um, a copy of the recording and the slides again in a follow-up email. Um, for those of you, well, if they haven't been able to stay, they won't be able to hearing this message anyway, but um, Everyone will get that anyway, along with some some FAQs. Brilliant. Is that okay to close that, Miriam? Excellent. Just one more slide, please. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to signpost you to a little bit more um, support uh, and information. And I know that other things have been shared in the chat as well, which is excellent. Um, so as you know, this is Small Charity Week. Um, NCVO are running a second free webinar tomorrow, all about workforce challenges. So recruiting and retaining staff and volunteers um, with a really expert panel to answer all of your questions. You can also head to the um, Small Charity Week website um, for events running throughout the week. And there'll also be recordings uploaded on the website of all of the official Small Charity Week events that have happened this week. 
I've put a link there to NCVO's guidance on funding and income and also to CIOF's guidance. And I think as Rob mentioned in the chat, um, membership of the CIOF is free for organisations with a voluntary income of under £50,000. And at NCVO, um, membership is free with, for those with an income of under £30,000. Next slide, please. So without further ado, we're finishing a little bit early, <laughs> um, but I want to say a huge thank you to all four of our absolutely brilliant panellists um, and thank them for sharing their stories and inspiring um, us with new ideas um, for raising unrestricted income. And with that being said, or lots of great thank yous coming in um, and hopefully our panelists can all see that. Thank you everybody for joining us. Um, hopefully you'll be able to fill in our feedback form when the webinar ends. Enjoy the rest of Small Charity Week. Um, hope you get to attend lots of useful events and training and hope to see you at our webinar tomorrow. Thank you everybody. Bye.